Welcome. I am Judith Kelly, the Dean of the Stanford School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted that you're joining us today for our Stand for Something series. We've had a number of these, Stand for Democracy, Stand for Equity, Justice, and today we're focusing on community. And this series really gets its name from our namesake, Terry Sanford, who said that um, if you get into politics with the frame of mind that you're just in it for the winning, then uh, you are not on the right track. He said, if you get in uh, to politics, you have to stand for something, even if it defeats you, that it's important that we know what we stand for. And I think that in this season that we are in now, it's more important than ever that we know what we're standing for. And so that's why we've called our series that. And we're very grateful to the uh, uh, William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust Fund Foundation for supporting this speaker series. Uh, we're also really grateful to Paulus, our Center for Politics and the Heart Leadership Program who partnered with us today uh, to put on this event. So this event today is special because we have a guest with us, Asha Kuran, and Asha is the CEO of Giving Tuesday. I hope you've heard about Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday, um, you'll learn all about it today, but it's a global giving movement. I would say it's a global generosity movement, and that's really what we're here to talk about today. Uh, and so Asha is, uh, is joining us um, to share about her experience in, in leading this uh, movement. Uh, and she's going to be joined today by DeAndre Rose, who, as you know, uh, many of you know, as the director, uh, associate director, co-director of the uh, uh, of the Polis Center for Politics, the associate director for research in the Center for Politics. And, uh, and DeAndre's research uh, focuses on um, feedback loops, meaning uh, she thinks about how policies that the government adopts gets experienced by citizens and how it affects their lives and how that then feeds back into the to the policy uh, cycle and she um, has done a landmark study on higher education uh, and uh, yeah she's one of our one of our uh, uh, our favorites here at the Zanford School and I'm glad that she's going to be taking us through this discussion today so uh, Deandra with that I'm going to hand it over to you Thank you so much, Judith. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And Asha, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here at Sanford. And Asha, I think we've got you on mute. Sorry about that. You think that we would have learned by now, right? <laughs> thank you for having me, Deandra. Well, thank Love you that. for being here. It's a whole new world for us, Asha. Um, so, Asha, for, for anyone who's new to learning about Giving Tuesday, I wonder if you could take just a second and tell us a little bit about what you do with Giving Tuesday. And I'd love to hear the story about how it came about. Sure. So, in 2012, um, I was working at the 92nd Street Y, which if there are New Yorkers on the Zoom, they know exactly what that is. Um, but for anybody who's not, it is a very big, very old, very prestigious um, cultural and community center on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, it's kind of long known for its um, events on stage, lectures and conversations with you know, luminaries and academics and so forth. Um, musical concerts and uh, has a very famous nursery school and it has classes of all descriptions. And it has kind of historically served a, a very local audience. Um, and what the work that I was doing there, and I was working closely with um, my then boss, Henry Timms, um, who is now, uh, who became CEO of the 92nd Street Y, is now CEO of Lincoln Center. Um, we were working on sort of reimagining the Y's mission for the 21st century. So that meant thinking a lot more about digital, a lot more about social, a lot more about global. Um, and all of those were sort of new muscles to be exercising for a, for a, a hyper-local um, cultural institution. And we had worked on a few different projects. Um, and one day he came into work and said, um, I had this great idea, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday. It was that simple of a setup. And I was like, I love it. Um, you know, let, 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 let's do it. And we launched it. We made a couple of early decisions that I think were really um, really important in those early days. One was to remove all branding from it, which as you can imagine, maybe we'll get into that later, was quite the internal 
um, controversy. And uh, we decided to launch it right away instead of getting caught in the nonprofit cycle of <laughs> um, subjecting a good idea to endless committee meetings uh, until it finally gets out in the world and is sort of a sludge of its former self. Um, we just got it out into the world and we sought lots of advice from people and asked people to be ambassadors. And, and so out the, the idea of Giving Tuesday went into the world, um, but it has become a radically different thing since then. And it, it, was, it was embraced right away. It was sort of um, targeted very specifically toward nonprofits and to, to people to be giving to nonprofits to support the causes they care about. It was sort of juxtaposed with Cyber Monday. So you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, two days that are great for the retail sector, you know, a day that's good for the nonprofit sector. Um, and it was it was very US focused by definition, right? Because you, you know, Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday are entirely US um, phenomena. Um, but what happened after that was that it started to cross borders um, and it has grown, you know, by double digits in, by almost every metric uh, every year since. And at this point, it is a global movement with 73 countries that have official local leaders who lead the movement in their countries in every continent and hundreds of local communities as well, by which I mean either small towns, big cities, entire states, or more recently, communities defined as by cause. So many organizations, activists, community organizers working together in coalitions around a specific cause for Giving Tuesday. Um, so it has really become a sort of global philanthropic phenomenon that we just couldn't have foreseen in those early days. Oh, that's wonderful. And I want to hear a lot more about the global reach of Giving Tuesday. And, and, and we'll talk about that hopefully later in our conversation. And I want to take a quick pause to invite our audience members to, you know, if you have questions, please don't be shy about putting them in the Q&A function so that Asha can uh, take them on. We're really excited to hear your questions. So please be thinking of those and feel free to enter them at any point in this discussion tonight in the Q&A function. So Asha, I, I, I want to come back to your work with Giving Tuesday and to ask you a little bit about the trajectory that got you there. Did you always know that you wanted to work in, philanthrop in philanthropy? And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that became your life. Oh, the very opposite. I had, I, I've never known I wanted to do anything I ended up doing. <laughs> and now, I, now that I'm you know, in my late 40s, I can look back and pretend that was strategic. <laughs> but it wasn't at all. Um, you know, I remember my very first job out of college. I, I graduated from college, kind of like raring to go. You know, I went to an all women's college and I was just like on fire, wanted to embrace the world and do all these amazing things. And I got to my first job. It was a publishing, I'm an entry level in a publishing company. And, and I just was so exhausted by the dreariness of the rhythm of the days and the the sort of early in the morning to late in the afternoon not allowing any time for anything else in my life and i just thought is this what i graduated for oh, so excited um and I, I guess over the years i realized that if i was going to have a career that was actually exciting that was actually creative and fast-paced and because my my enemy is boredom um that i was going to have to create it myself and so I, I, I guess I would best describe it as like, when something interested me, I would just immerse myself in it completely. And then when something else interested me, I would, I would then sort of switch tracks. Um, and the reason that I ended up at the 92nd Street Y was because I worked with them as a non-employee. Um, and then I had a child and I, I left the job I was at and the rabbi who I worked with there called and offered me a part-time job working on their Jewish lecture program, which is funny because I'm an Irish Catholic. But when, once I got there, I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> so I just immersed myself in Middle Eastern politics. And you know, when, when that got boring, I moved on to the next thing. So no, I had absolutely no philanthropic background at all. And I actually think that's really germane, right? Because again, like, just like I can sort of look back now and pretend there was some strategic you know, impulse to the whole career trajectory, it's also tempting to buy into the narrative that I broke all these rules with Giving Tuesday, right? Like flouted all this conventional wisdom. Believe me, I love that narrative, but it's just not true, <laughs> right? The, the real reason was that I just didn't know any of those rules. I didn't know any of the conventional wisdom. And I think that that's probably all the better for Giving Tuesday, right? I just, it was like very zero based, meaning that everything was sort of um, what seemed to be wise in the moment with lots of experimentation. If I had been from the philanthropic sector, I, I, I don't think that Giving Tuesday would be um, 
you know, what it is now. And I think a lot of people who engage with Giving Tuesday are not from the philanthropic sector either. But now I'm in it and it, and it fascinates me and I'm still, I, I still feel like the new girl in the, in the room philanthropically. I love this. And, and I've heard you describe Giving Tuesday as part of the global generosity movement. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that idea. You know, what does this movement include and what are the boundaries of the movement? Yeah, so to me, the fascinating thing about Giving Tuesday is not the fact that it has so much fundraising success. For me, that I'm, I'm super glad it does, and I'm, I'm you know, always really happy to hear about organizations that have success with it and that get, get lots of resource. Uh, and I also think, you know, from a perspective of appreciating um, what some people call small dollar donors or everyday givers, I don't really like any of these phrases, but... Um, from the perspective of that, you know, almost $2 billion was donated last Giving Tuesday, just in the United States. And, and to put that in context, that's more money than any major US foundation gives away in a full calendar year, with the exception of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, all from regular people who are not issuing any press releases about their generosity, right? And that it, it, it essentially amounts to a $2 billion general operating grant into the nonprofit economy, which is remarkable. But it is also still just one small part of what Giving Tuesday is. And to me, the interesting part of Giving Tuesday are the lessons about movement building. And the, the, the model of every movement is different, fascinatingly so. You have everything from you know, an Occupy um, kind of movement, which is utterly decentralized, really by design leaderless, right? Completely flat in terms of hierarchy. Um, to you know, other movements that have very prominent leaders, right, where the movement becomes a sort of cult of personality, not necessarily in a bad way, um, and it becomes much more of a traditional sort of power structure. Giving Tuesday within that spectrum occupies a really unique space. So it it has a, 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 a what we call a nucleus, right? That's that's our organization. So what I'm actually CEO of is a nonprofit. It's a 25 person, right, fairly small. Um, nonprofit with a globally distributed staff, and we exist to then support the broader movement. So our constituents um, really are the leaders from those 73 countries and hundreds of local communities. They form our very, very closest community. And these are people who are, who raise their hands, right? And we, we use that term very intentionally. We, we call them hand raisers because to lead a Giving Tuesday movement, right? I wouldn't say necessarily a campaign, right, for an organization, but to, to really take on, a, a, to really wrap your, your arms around a full country, to understand the kind of open source mechanisms and guiding principles of Giving Tuesday, is really to have to believe in it really deeply. Because these country leaders are full-time employed and then some, right? Some of them are in countries, you know, like Colombia and Venezuela and Ukraine, and the list goes on and on, countries that are in poverty, that are in famine, that are at war. And the fascinating thing is that they, those countries really double down on Giving Tuesday in ways that surprised me at first, that I thought, oh, well, you know, this country's having a really, really hard time. They'll come back to Giving Tuesday next year. But, but no, they actually see it as, a bridge from crisis to a healthier civil society. And that's where Giving Tuesday started to get really fascinating. For me, the potential of it became so clear. So we have this nucleus organization. We have this globally distributed network community of leaders. And that is interesting enough, right? But what makes it much more interesting is that they are an incredibly interconnected community. And so the, the principles that drive that community are lateralism, right? The, the, a, a high GDP country is not more important to us than a tiny little country, um, a, a rich country, not more important than a small country, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Highly pluralistic, representative of so many different languages, ethnicities, religions, et cetera. And they are in it together. They consider themselves engaged in a shared mission. And, and that is really the definition of a movement, regardless of its model, is that the people who are engaging with it are imagining something together, are co-creating something together. Mm -hmm. And so they have taken Giving Tuesday from being a day to being a year-round movement with one day of celebration. Right. So I hardly even think of the day itself anymore. I know a lot of people do, but for me, it's like, it's like a big day for sure. Um, but, but every day is work. Every day is meaningful. And the leaders also feel like the definition of success is 
if they have a success, then seeing it replicated throughout the network. Mm -hmm. And that's where the potential of the model is also so powerful, right? Imagine a good idea or an innovation or something that really works happening in Chile and being replicated within the space of weeks or months, right? In Tanzania, in Russia, in Estonia, right? the list goes on. That kind of rapid adoption across a network is incredibly powerful to see. And the kind of um, breaking down of nationalist borders is also, so we have until COVID, we had a once a year in a different place in the world every time, um, a, uh, a summit where we gather all of our country leaders together and they're like it's just not about what country they're from right so you'll see you know, india and pakistan you know kind of chatting over there in the corner about how to grow generosity in their countries and ukraine and russia over here it just doesn't matter if their countries are you know antagonistic toward each other what matters is their is their shared mission so that that's the model of giving tuesday it's, it's relatively simple yet as far as i can tell really unique Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what sells a lot of movements ultimately is um, factionalism and infighting, right? And so the, the thing that I consider the most important part of my job is really um, helping to keep those, the culture of that community trusting, supportive, transparent, right? So that that factionalism and that infighting doesn't happen and it hasn't yet. Huh. So speaking of factionalism and infighting, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm struck by some of the contrasts between this movement and some government institutions, for example. And I, I'm really fascinated by what you're saying in terms of how, you know, examples from one country in terms of lessons or, or examples of how to get things done can really spread very quickly. There's a nimbleness to this that I think is very, very different from what a lot of our political institutions grapple with. And so, you know, I, I think of social movements as being in tension with political institutions oftentimes. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, the role that philanthropy and organizations like, or, or initiatives like Giving Tuesday play in a landscape, a political landscape that also includes government institutions? Like what's the relationship between the two? Well, it's different in every country. And I would even say that what you're saying is true, even if you take the word political out of it, right? Because it's true of all institutions. Mm -hmm. Now Giving Tuesday is lucky or well positioned in a way because it is apolitical, right? Mm -hmm. We are politically agnostic. It's funny, we are on the one hand, quite radical and on the other hand politically agnostic right we are about celebrating the agency and the capacity of every human being to make a positive impact on their community and their world we're about reimagining a better world driven by generosity um, but we are also a big tent and um and anyone is welcome who wants to do good right it doesn't mean we draw any sort of moral equivalence between love and hate, right? But we, but we welcome anybody who wants to do good and, and who wants to manifest generosity in their own ways. So because of that, it's not something that government institutions are necessarily wary of or nervous of. Um, and in some cases, they've really seen it as a way to, um, to really plug in and, and help things happen at a really grassroots level. So at, in, um, in Ukraine, for example, they were able to get a Giving Tuesday curriculum into like 2,000 schools. That, that's something we haven't been able to achieve here in, in nine years of trying. We haven't been able to get a generosity curriculum into any, even a citywide public school system. And they managed to do that, you know, with, with the aid of, um, of governmental agencies. In some countries, um, the Giving Tuesday leaders actually receive government funding. We don't, but that's how it works in some places. In some places, they receive funding from the American embassy, right? So, um, you know, in most places, it is, there's, there's a wall, right? It's not a political movement and the government usually just kind of ignores it. Um, where they have intervened, it's, it's actually been because they've been helpful. We're always really careful of that. When we have a new country come on, we really vet the political landscape and its, its relationship to the nonprofit or the NGO community really, really carefully because there is corruption, right? And there is, um, you know, puppeteerism and, and so forth. But it's, it's fascinating to me to consider, like it, institutions, political or otherwise, are not going anywhere, right? And neither are movements. And so you, you're gonna have these two forces that are built so differently, right? With like just radically different models, 
different conceptions of leadership, different conceptions of power, um, different goals in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And you see this now happening, but I think it's only going to happen more. You see this sort of collision of these two forces and they're going to have to work together. Right. That's like that, that is a skill that is going to have to be learned. So there's, you know, it, traditional philanthropic institutions, you know, with, this is not a generalism, a generalization. We're we're very lucky to actually be funded by several huge foundations who are, who are willing to take the risk of investing in us. We are a movement. Right. Um, but but there has been a reluctance to embrace that sort of systems level change. Um, and that the sort of model that that represents because it does incorporate some some extra risk mm -hmm. Because so much is shifting in the movement direction though That's not something that is going to be able to be avoided like that's something that's going to have to happen And it can either be a tension or a collision or a harmony right a, 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 a acknowledging that institutions political institutions, philanthropic institutions are going to be able to achieve certain things and movements are going to be able to achieve certain things and where can they plug in and where can they integrate? What, one thing that I feel you know, increasingly strongly about is that people in communities know what those communities need, you know, kind of full stop. And that the style of like Western intervention in the rest of the world, right? We know how to solve these problems. It, like if Giving Tuesday has proven one thing to me, it's that people know what their own communities need and that there are leaders in those communities that need to be lifted up and supported, right? And, and, and resourced. Um, and, and that's, you know, that represents a big shift as well. So I, I wonder if, if you could speak a little bit about COVID-19 and even the, the contemporary movement and awakening around racial justice. Have they had have they played a role in shaping your work with Giving Tuesday and maybe even accelerating some of the, the forces you mentioned a moment ago in the movement? Absolutely, absolutely. I have a fly in here. It's like, <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, I think that the current moment has in some ways changed us forever. You know, all of us, I guess that's kind of a, just a broad truth, um, but it certainly has changed us at Giving Tuesday. Not that we didn't have, you know, really broad and very, very deep, you know, root level ambitions already, but I think it, it just laid bare um, some of the things in our world that are so fundamentally ungenerous. I mean, there are many things, right? But, but it's my job to think about generosity. And so I look at them and I think, you know, justice is not possible in an ungenerous world. Equality is not possible in an ungenerous world. And so it, it just deepened our conviction, right? To, to sort of reimagine that world and no better time to reimagine it than when it's falling apart all around us, right? That, that is the opportunity, that is the moment of, of hope that you get, that is the gift in a, in a horrible moment like this one, right? When people are demanding change and when so many things are being exposed to be false or harmful or like the the illusion that the way we worked was ever actually necessary <laughs> like i I'm, I'm delighted to see that myth fall away because i think it was so fundamentally inequitable along with many other things and i hope it never goes back to the way that it was before right um but so i think when 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 covid hit you know we were first of all organizationally in a really fortunate position because we are supported by um, institutional funders and so we didn't unlike performing arts organizations or so many organizations we didn't have earned revenue to lose and so we were able to to actually double down on what we wanted to achieve rather than retreating which would have been a smart thing to do in in one hand from a from a fiscal perspective right like we don't know what's coming down the pipe we really should save every dime that you don't actually have to spend on the other hand we saw an opportunity to step in Right? and do something in the current moment that would help people, that would draw people together, that would connect people. Giving Tuesday has always been fundamentally about shared humanity. And I think we are, we are feeling that, right? That we have it, that we need to embrace it, that we need to build it in better ways, um, that we are all so deeply interconnected, right? We are, we are interdependent and interconnected. And so we need to be those things in a positive way. Um, and, and, and so this, this moment just really, really deepened that. So what we did was to create a special um, uh, Giving Tuesday, which we called Giving Tuesday Now, which happened on May 5th. And we really positioned that day around um, kindness, 
you know, empathy, help and healing rather than money. But a, a lot of money was still raised, which <laughs> was really fantastic. And it was, it was also to me, you know, the boring wonky part of my view on Giving Tuesday, it was also such a validation of that model, right? The, the nucleus model that I, that I just described because, because we had such a tight knit global community, we were able to all activate at the same time with like three and a half weeks notice, we were able to just pull all of these countries together to stand up a special day in their own regions. And it was just, it was just really inspiring. Um, and then after that, you know, sort of as the world realized, oh, this isn't gonna go away, right? Quite as quickly as we had hoped and like things are like just fundamentally different. Um, we have just, I think every week felt more and more relevant, right? That the message of generosity underpinning the, the very foundations of the society we wanna build is just absolutely critical. And we have, it's interesting, we have a um, kind of all year round social media listening company thing that we do and that gives us reports on what's sort of what's happening broadly across social. And at the same time last year, the words associated with Giving Tuesday were like giving and donation and something, generosity maybe. And now, the words most the used most commonly with Giving Tuesday are justice and community. Really? So I think that, yeah. So I think that people are feeling that without us even having to say it, right? And the, the amazing thing to me about the current moment is, and I'm so, I just feel so lucky that I get to see this and be exposed to it every day, right? Because I think it, to some extent, the work you do informs your outlook on life. And I just see people being so extraordinarily generous. It's just unbelievable, you know, and, and at, a, at a really grassroots level, right? Certainly organizations have, I think, pivoted in really amazing ways to meet the moment, even if they're suffering. Um, and other organizations are clearly like keeping people fed, keeping people sheltered. But then there are also just people, like just people, like our neighbors, right? That are stepping forward to you know, use technology to make sure that everybody in that community has what they need and that other people in the communities can share what they have to give, right? And that the two get matched up, right? The proliferation of mutual aid networks around the, around the country and around the world. Um, other people who are just doing remarkable things. We just had a, a, a jazz organization in Oakland is not able to perform their concerts anymore, but the musicians really want to play. And what they decided to do was to perform open air jazz concerts for the people who are waiting six and seven hours in line at the food bank. Right, so I love, I love this because I love the conception of generosity to me is not just making sure that somebody has a can of soup, right? That's just basic decency, right? That, that's just what a society should basically do. This concept of like then elevating it to bring beauty or joy or art into people's lives even as they are in isolation or, um, or going through the psychological you know, horror of having to wait six hours to make sure they can feed their kids. Right, so that, that kind of just basic, um, just generosity practice, it's, it's everywhere. Like there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of it. So I hope we can you know, use this as a moment to acknowledge the powerful work that people do in their own communities, again. So Asha, you know, I know you mentioned that, that Giving Tuesday is apolitical, it's not a political movement, but I'm a political scientist and I can't help but to think of some of the, the implications here, especially on the individual level as being patently political and maybe even you know, pro-democratic. Like I think there's something, you've, you've spoken about agency and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, like just what participating in generosity or, or expressions of generosity might do for individuals in terms of their development as citizens, as development, their development as members of communities. And um, I, I feel like, I mean, that strikes me as something that's potentially very empowering. It is. I'm really glad you asked that question because it's such a fascinating, it's actually such a fascinating feedback loop. <sighs> ah! So I think, you know, there's first, the first thing I hear you have on this one bucket, you have this kind of current moment that there's this kind of backlash against big philanthropy, right? That there's this kind of questioning whether 
very, very wealthy people giving money to their causes or to people is actually addressing some of the fundamental problems that we're seeing sort of ripped bare now during during the pandemic, right? And so you have this big reckoning happening with big philanthropy, and that's both with you know with individual billionaires and also with institutional funders and so forth, and a lot of feeling like th th that all might be very generous, but generosity doesn't equal justice, right? I sort of come at it from the other, I, I agree with that. And, and I think there's also that you can't have justice without generosity. Mm -hmm. And that when, you know, our, our, even our founding fathers knew this, right? That they, that they outlined that values drive our engagement as citizens, the way that we act in our, in our shared spaces, right? It's driven by values. And you just can't have policy without that, right? You can't, you can't craft the best policy without having those, those driving values and generosity is, in my mind, you know, other than love, the most universal of, of all values, just a really fundamental human instinct. It's also so undervalued as a metric of civic participation, right? Like voting gets all the attention as, as the, you know, as the, the gauge of whether somebody is um, civically, you know, in, engaged or civically active. But the truth is that the more, more generous a community is, the more generous a country is, the healthier they are the healthier that, that society is. And I have no doubt that one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons is that that can't help but ladder up to the policy level, right? Because we choose our representatives, right? Based on our own values. And so we want to see them putting policy into action that is guided by those same values. Um, but it's also true at just a very basic, um, very, very grassroots level. And, and yes, I do think it is fundamentally sort of pro-democratic principles, small d, um, for sure. But I also see it working so powerfully in many, many, many different um, political systems, mm -hmm. and including in some that are the generosity is so woven together at a grassroots level because there's dictatorship or corruption, right? That, that to keep the social fabric from completely tearing, it is these deeply embedded cultural generosity traditions that, that kind of keeps it all together. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. That is fascinating, I have to say. That's, that's exciting to hear about. So Asha, you also, you know, I'm thinking about the work that you do and the fact that it's so innovative and it really is outside of the box. And I can only imagine that when you do the kind of work that really sort of pushes boundaries, um, that it's just the easiest thing to do and everybody goes along with your new ideas and it's just roses and parades oh. every day. <laughs> no, no. Aisha, I'd love to hear, do you ever experience resistance when it comes to, you know, pushing this kind of new model or, or unique model? Oh, yeah, definitely. Since minute one. I mean, for sure. Like that just, you know, we actually had a really supportive team at the 92nd Street Y. We had a board member who we were lucky enough was invested with us and in, in our sort of dream of innovation right from the beginning. And that kind of, you know, institutional, um, uh, buy-in is incredibly important, right? You're never going to get anything done without the, at least the leeway from leadership. It doesn't even have to be outright encouragement. So from that, that perspective, we were really lucky. There was also resistance, right? There was resistance to this idea of unbranding, which was a word that we coined several years after the, the actual concept, right? So this idea that things seem to be changing, right? The way that people engaged with brands, with logos, Right, it seemed very much to be sort of going, right, sort of exiting stage left. And that if we really wanted to invest in the core idea of Giving Tuesday, which is like this idea of co-ownership, that it couldn't be branded because branding by definition means that something is owned, right? So if we were the 92nd Street Wise Giving Tuesday, we would already be owned and there would be no sense of co-ownership. And we really wanted this idea to be taken by people, to be changed, to be adapted. Um, and, and that, you know, that was like a bunch of internal conversations. It was really funny. The, the, the uh, graphic designer at the Y who um, designed our very first logo, which is like still our logo, you know, maybe should it up a little bit, but it's still our logo. He designed it. We loved it. Beautiful in its simplicity. You know, it was based around the idea of a heart, which we which just felt completely right. Um, because in, in every religion, every culture, right, the, the idea of charity, of giving, whatever you want to call it, is, is rooted in love. Um, 
when, when the first countries and organizations and communities started to take it and change it, the very first organization to do that changed it to Giving Shoes Day. <laughs> they were, it was a nonprofit called Dress for Success and they, um, they give clothing and shoes and so forth to women who are re-entering the workforce for various reasons after, after being out of it. And we were like, like that, that's a moment where a traditional nonprofit would call in their lawyer and, and issue a cease and desist letter, right? And say, you know, use this idea the way we created it, use it with our branding and our logo. And we just didn't do it. And the, the, the graphic designer was like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, like had a moment. But that, it was a journey and it ended with him just being incredibly proud that this logo he created was being used, wrapped in all these different flag colors, right? And markers of different cultural identities and so forth. That was what made it so incredibly special. Um, and then over the years, certainly, you know, there, there was also just from within the fundraising world, tons of is this going to eat up money, you know, from end of year, because traditionally December 31st is the biggest year for financial giving. Um, that was absolutely not the case of anything. It has benefited it by drawing back the bookend of the giving season, right? And making, making the giving season much longer. Um, so that none of those concerns could have sort of, you know, came to light. And then there, there have been a lot of conversations with funders with me saying like, you should support this great thing, you know, and then saying, you know, we really love the idea, but like, it's just too risky to give capital to, uh, you know, a move of an organization or the center of an organization that's then going to support unknown actors in foreign countries. Now, you know, we're, we're so lucky that we do, we have, we have had those conversations enough times and I kind of start them out with, I know this isn't going to fit anything that you've done before, but just hear me out, right? And that seems to be, you know, that, that seems to be more successful um, because when something's a true innovation, it's never going to fit neatly into anybody's portfolio, right? It's always going to be a, um, a square peg. Uh, and then I think at this point, I, the, the backlash I see is mostly about misunderstanding what it is, right? And being annoyed at um, getting too many solicitations on Giving Tuesday, right? I, I hate Giving Tuesday because I had to delete 20 emails from nonprofits asking me for support today. And I'm like, oh, well, all this amazing stuff was happening in the slums of Johannesburg, but I'm so sorry that you had to delete 20 emails from your inbox. But I try not to be that snarky and I try to be very level-headed about it. Um, so, and, and to really just try to, to, to broaden the messaging a little bit, right? To, to have it really be understood that it is about generosity and that giving money is part of that, but only part of it. But yes, if you're trying to be creative, if you're trying to do things differently, if you really believe in what, you, what you're doing, of course, you're gonna ruffle feathers and you're going to um, get pushed back and, you, and, it's, and it's a great muscle to strengthen to learn to deal with that. And I'm not saying I always deal with it well, but it's a lot better than a few years ago. I love that. So, you know, I, I want to take a, a brief pause to share with all of our attendees that we have a poll that we would like to launch right now. And uh, we invite you to take just a moment and there are five quick questions for you. Um, one, have you ever participated in Giving Tuesday? Uh, two, do you plan to participate on December 1st of 2020? Three, if you do plan to participate, will you more likely give money, give time, give support, or advocate for an issue? And number four, what issues are likely to be the beneficiary of your generosity? And there are a number of choices there. And then finally, would you be interested in participating in a Sanford-led group um, volunteer or a group fundraiser? And if the answer is yes, could you please drop your name and email in the Q&A box and we'll uh, make note of that and follow up with you. So uh, we'll give our audience members a little time to participate in the poll and then we'll come back to share the results in just a little while. I'd also like to invite you to please submit your questions in the Q&A box if you haven't already. Uh, really looking forward to turning to some of those questions in just a few minutes. But Asha, I, I wanna pick up a little bit again on just sort of the global perspective of the work that you're doing. And I have to say, I really, I'm, as, as somebody who is an absolute control freak, the idea of having a model and then being willing to share that model and to distribute it broadly, it's something that I, I marvel at. And I'd love to hear, you know, just a little bit about 
um, you know, how this works, you know, sort of pushing this out globally. And then I'd love to hear of any lessons, you know, that, that you might be able to share with us from, you know, looking at generosity from lots of different cultural perspectives. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just the most fascinating thing about Giving Tuesday is, you know, seeing a community grow like this and understanding, growing to understand what keeps it cohesive right, is the thing that keeps it cohesive that everyone signed a contract that they have to behave a certain way, right, is the thing that keeps it cohesive that you share a, a larger vision and that the norms that are set by the community itself and by the central leadership are norms of generosity within as well as generosity without, which is not always true of the nonprofit world or of the philanthropic world, um, of mutually assured support, of feeling like you're a success if other people can replicate your work and make it a success. Like those kind of norms being set early and being set often just gives such a gravity to the, to the community in my experience that is the thing that has kept it working um, together so well through all these years. And it's not, you know, there, there's, I have no leverage, right? I have no actual leverage. Like they, there's certain things that we ask country leaders to agree to, for example, and community leaders. One of the things is just continuation of this idea of unbranding, right? That it's not about your organization. If you sign on to be a Giving Tuesday leader, you're agreeing that you're putting the movement first, right? And, and that's a big thing. Like we make it really clear that, you know, this is work on top of your other full-time work. These people are all working full-time, right? Sometimes full-time times 10. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then this is a whole additional thing. It's, it's, it takes resource, it takes work. Um, and that's, so that's one kind of, I hate the word rule. That's just one guiding principle that we feel kind of insisting on. Another one is that the movement is open to all. Right. So, you know, we had early conversations about, you know, what if organizations want to use Giving Tuesday that we don't agree with. Right. And that like there was just nowhere that we could end that conversation other than if this is really an open source generosity movement that encourages people to manifest their generosity as they see fit. How could we possibly say we believe all that if you believe in the things we believe in. Right. We couldn't. And so, um, you know, people sign on to lead and they agree to those sort of general principles. But if they chose to just start ignoring them, right, then, then literally like the only thing that we could do is say, well, you're not welcome in the WhatsApp group anymore. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and yet that's actually quite powerful leverage because it's such a rewarding thing to be part of, right? Being part of that, and I'm being flippant when I say just a WhatsApp, they're, I mean, they're literally on WhatsApp. Like that's, that's our main platform of communication is WhatsApp. And they, they just talk all day, every day. Um, but it is, it's also, you know, it's seeing each other in person, being part of, being part of that community and having access to each other, mm -hmm. right? Is the main thing. And so all of that is worth the letting go you know, and the sort of risk, you know, the sort of inherent risk and loss of, of ownership that comes with that. I'm convinced, I have to say, like, I think I'd be <laughs> willing to forfeit some of that. So I have a question right now from uh, Kristen Goss. And Kristen asks, she says, you mentioned that movements vary in structure. What kinds of civic activity beyond charitable giving might Giving Tuesday serve as a model? Well, I hope I understand the question. If I don't answer it correctly, then please, whoever that was, um, you know, write back, clarify, push me on answering it better. And I realized, Deandre, that I did not actually answer the global part of your question. So I hope we can come back to that. Definitely. Um, so we see generosity as two things. We see it as a means and we see it as an end, right? So an act of generosity in and of itself is a good and worthy thing. And we do not believe, and this is very different than many in the philanthropic sector on ever placing a value judgment on someone else's act of generosity, right? Um, and there's a lot of that, that that, this, that, that wasn't evidence-based, giving to this is better than giving to that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we don't engage in any of that and we don't believe in it. Um, and then we also see it as a means and it is a means to so many other altruistic and pro-social behaviors. There, there will be a point where we will be able to measure if engaging in generosity behaviors 
um, encourages people to be more civically engaged in other ways, right? Are they more likely to vote? Are they more likely to run for office? Right. Are, are they more likely to um, to just be pro-social in, in various ways that manifest in society in healthy and productive ways? So I, I think that that is our that's our hope for it in terms of the other civic implications for it. Um, you know, I, I think that there's there are a lot of values, right? And they're all good values are good values. Um, but I think for me, generosity is basically a a, a, a a value that's driven by solidarity, right? It's, it's a value that is fundamentally about caring for your fellow humans, right? And this just, as a foundation for behavior, for everyday behavior, for policy, for the building of institutions, for the creation of shared civic spaces, there's just nothing that, that more generosity couldn't benefit. That's great. Okay, next question from Gunther Peck. Gunther says, I love the model of co-ownership. I wonder if you think the recent transformation of generosity from doing good to doing justice has been driven by other social movements, um, in parentheses, their generosity, yours, or both? Oh, what a great question. I bet you could answer this more intelligently than I could, but I, I think that more likely that the, yes, movements have, um, and I, and I think they're premised on just the, the obviousness, the obscene obviousness of income inequality hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the realization that philanthropy as it has existed up until now does not seem to be ameliorating that problem. And that people are just, it's a big problem when a country lets any of its citizens fall through the cracks, right? That like, we should all just be able to agree on that, right? We should all be able to agree that if somebody works, they shouldn't be hungry. <laughs> like, they're, it's just like fundamental things like, that, we, that we should, you know, that are, in my mind are, are also, you know, very much backed um, by generosity. So I think, I think that's one thing that has really exposed it. But certainly social movements, you know, all, all grievances are shared grievances, right? And so movements are overlapping now. There are so many, right? And they, they all share such fundamental um, goals and missions. And, and most of all, they, what they share is being radical. And by radical, don't anybody get scared, I mean that from the original etymology of the word radical, which is from the root, right? So movements are about reimagining things from their very most basic foundations. Right, you, you don't have a movement around slapping a Band-Aid on some problem. <laughs> that's not a movement, right? And, that, and sometimes that's what philanthropy does, right? And so you have all of these movements right now, all imagining things radically, right? All imagining, right, a world where there is racial equity, a world where there is not violence and harassment against women, right? a world where et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a world where there is more fundamental generosity. And so they're, they're all gonna overlap and they're all gonna lead to eruptions, declarations, and demands for accountability in various ways. That's great. Thank you so much. So Asha, before we circle back to the last couple of questions, I do want to share the results of the poll. So let's see, hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so, you know, number one, have you participated in Giving Tuesday? Like 74% of people here today have, so that's amazing. Um, a full 63% plan on participating this year, December 1st, 2020. If you plan to participate, will you more likely give money, time, support, or advocate for an issue? And 60% say money, uh, followed by 34% who say advocacy, 26% uh, say help. Oh, and I see 37% uh, more than one way. Question four. We'll come, back to that one. we'll come back to that one, okay. And then four, what issues are likely to be the beneficiary of your generosity? And there's a pretty even split among all except for social justice at 57%. Um, so a very strong um, favor there. Wow. And then also 29% saying more than one, 29% saying climate, energy, and environment. Mm -hmm. um, higher education at 23%, health and education at 26%. And then number five, would you be interested in participating in a Sanford-led group? Um, and so, gosh, yeah, I'll be in touch if I can help with 49%. Uh, so Wonderful. please don't hesitate to circle back to us on that one. 
So Asha, I know you wanted to chat about, was it number three? Yeah, I just wanted to say that number three is a really fascinating one. I was, I was really hoping that there was a more than one way answer. Um, our data is actually really fascinating in that it indicates that the most common way of engaging with Giving Tuesday in the United States is by giving money, but the least common way is by only giving money. Huh. I think that's totally fascinating, right? So there's, our data is very counter to what is some accepted wisdom in the, in the sector right now, which is that all these young people, right, that are like giving to GoFundMes and giving to give directly and, right, um, you know, taking out the intermediary, right? Essentially like skipping the nonprofit altogether and finding ways to get support to people or causes directly mm -hmm. um, is very concerning to the nonprofit world, right? It's like, what's gonna happen to nonprofits if we disintermediate them? But our data actually shows that, that people who are, you know, give to a GoFundMe are also likely to give to nonprofits. And they're also likely to bring a casserole to a new neighbor. And they're also likely to give some money to a homeless person. Like generous people are generous and they're gonna act out that generosity in, in numerous ways. And my, my belief is that the vast, vast, vast majority of humans are, are generous and that Giving Tuesday is largely about bringing an intentionality, right? A, a new intentionality to those acts and to understand to, to be able to identify all the ways that, that, that all of you are generous every single day that you don't necessarily attach that value to and begin to really understand why you do it, why it's rewarding, how you can do more of it. Um, so so giving, you know, giving money, like again, that, that we've gone from such a transactional vision of giving, right? Giving on December 31st, you know, my parents' generation, it would have been literally the last thing you do in the year is think about giving. Like, that is actually right. We see, and you sit down and you just give it to your chosen nonprofit, and you just do the same nonprofit every year. And now it couldn't be more different. Like one thing I, I advise people is to not even use the word donors. Nobody mm -hmm. relates to that word. Nobody. Call people ambassadors. Call them givers. Right. But like they are, they are the people who are engaged in your work. They're not ATM machines. Right. They're not just handing you some money. And give them multiple mm -hmm. points of entry, multiple ways to engage because that's what people want to do. And they want to feel like they're, they have their fingers deep in the work and they're, they're really making an impact with it. Speaking of, of that impact and the different ways that people, people you know, are part of that movement, I want to return to the global perspective. And I'd love to hear, I, I've heard you speak about just some really fascinating models and, and instances of giving that you've been able to observe on, in, from lots of our global neighbors um, in the global community. And I'd love to hear more about that. Are there any that really stick out to you? Oh, so many. I, I just, I feel like I've become a ch totally changed person by being able to fly all over the world, which I did way too much of pre-pandemic. Um, but I just couldn't, I couldn't stop because being immersed in that, in those worlds, right, and really understanding what giving looks like in different places was just so deeply fascinating to me. And one of the most fascinating, yeah, I mean, there's a million that I could name. Um, I think really interestingly in many African countries, there are various forms of rotational giving schemes, right? So there are various ways in which different community members put money into a common pot, and then that money then goes to whoever, whichever one of those community members needs it. And then everybody just begins giving again. And so in some countries, the, the tradition is that it's for a new baby, right? And for some, it's um, to pay for a lease. And for some, it's to pay for people who are having an emergency, right? But it's a very deeply embedded tradition. It's what, what they call informal, but it's not even, it's not even like, it's not even a concrete plan. It's just been inherited, right? Generation after generation after generation. Um, and, and many times it has nothing to do with money at, at all, right? I think I shared with you earlier down to that in Senegal, um, it's culturally unacceptable for people to eat alone, right? And yet, get, get, you know, all of that aside, and there's, there's just, there's so many and they're, 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 they're so awesome. Um, you know, Latin America and Asia, and they're just all, all different, all around the map, Europe. Um, and yet we have long um, accepted this narrative that the United States is the most generous country. And it grates on me every time I read it now, because it, what it means is that we have the highest donation levels, right? We have the highest amount of transferred wealth from one hand to another philanthropically 
And that doesn't make us a generous nation, right? Like the, the, it, what it makes us is, is a nation that looks at things very transactionally, that, that, that's, that that's the definition of most generous and that that way of thinking has pervaded other places in the world as well. Um, and I just don't think we can claim that mantle. I just think that while we have people, while it's still completely culturally acceptable here to eat alone, <laughs> right? There have been books written about our levels of isolation in this country we can't possibly call ourselves the most generous and that we should be proud of our high donation levels and there's a long embedded tradition and so forth and it leads to a healthier civil society. But there's a lot more that we need to do to be proud of our generosity. Absolutely. And I just want to pass along a note from Gunther Peck. He says, I love how critique and generosity live together in your answer and nothing wrong with radical. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Gunther. And then final question from Jenna Houchins. Jenna says, before coming to Duke, I was working for an international nonprofit and helping with their COVID-19 response for the populations they serve. A huge issue in the NGO, ran, the, a huge issue the NGO ran into was that many former donors from the US had decided to donate to US organizations instead of abroad. Given all that, um, that was slash is going on in the US, how do you see this year's Giving Tuesday for international organizations? And what tips might you give them as that day approaches? This is an interesting question. It, I, I, and I have both the personal and a professional opinion about it. I probably, should probably share the, the professional opinion. Although I, I have touched on the personal opinion before, which is that leaders in communities know what those communities need. And I would like to see those local leaders more properly resourced. Um, and I think particularly now when we have such a kind of new understanding of why the most powerful people get to decide what works on behalf of everyone else, right? Like the, there's a real questioning of that assumption now than, uh, than I've ever seen before. Um, the professional answer is I'm in a very lucky position in that I never have to make decisions or give advice on this score, right? Like Giving Tuesday is owned by large NGOs who do work in other, you know, who are based in the US and do work in other parts of the world. It is owned by all the local leaders and the local NGOs who do work in their own localities. And that's the nature of an open source, um, of an open source movement. You know, I think big, uh, big NGOs are in an interesting position when it comes to Giving Tuesday. A lot of people assume that big NGOs do a lot better on Giving Tuesday because they have more research, they have more social following, they have more marketing muscle, but it's actually not true. Actually, smaller organizations do much better proportionally. Hmm. Um, and, I, and I think the reason is that smaller organizations are more agile. They're able to be a lot more creative quickly. They're able to think of an idea and like get it out to market without having it go through insane levels of bureaucracy. Hmm. Um, and, and approvals and, and so forth. One of our most successful organizations a few years ago was this organization called the Badass Brooklyn Animal Rescue. They don't have a single paid staff member. And yet they did this amazing sort of live Instagramming a rescue, right? A rescue of, of a bunch of um, dogs from Georgia uh, back to New York, you know? And they had their most successful day ever. It just like blew them into a totally different category. So I think there's something about being small and agile that puts those organizations in, on slightly better footing. Um, that's not a complete answer to the question of US, you know, US organizations doing work abroad versus um, NGOs doing work in their own communities. But I would say that, that question, and when you say the NGO ran into that issue, I don't know what, I don't quite know what exactly that means. Was it a PR issue? Was it a politics issue? But I think it's one that will only come up more and more and more as we see this new sort of level of questioning of everything, right? Everything about the way things have worked, the way things have been structured, the way power works, like we're just at a moment where all of that is, is gonna be a topic of conversation for a really long time to come. And along with that conversation, there will be changes. And what that means for, you know, big NGOs, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. Mm. Well, speaking of conversations, Asha, I feel like this one I could continue for hours. And thank you so much for your time and for being with us today. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for all these really, really smart questions too. Smart students.
Thank you so much. And, and many thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to Asha, to the Sanford Comms team, to the Heart Leadership Program, to Paula Center for Politics, and everyone who helped to make tonight's event possible. We hope that you will join us for our next you know, upcoming Sanford events the rest of this semester, and we'll wish you a very happy evening. Thanks so much, everybody. Take Thank care. You all.